guys, happy Friday. Welcome back to the q and If you're new here, welcome. My name is Andrea. I'm a dermatologist. I film day in the life of a dermatologist vlogs, as well as sit down skincare Q&A similar to this one. So today's Q&A will be the final and third part of my um, sunscreen Q&As, uh, which you all seem to be enjoying. And in my last Q&A, I addressed all of your questions about sunscreen ingredient safety and filters and the safety of sunless tanners as well as sunscreen use in children. And in today's video, I'm going to answer all of your questions about how to apply sunscreen, how much sunscreen to apply, what exactly the SPF means, and what kind of protection that we can expect from sunscreen. All right, so with that, let's get started. So in part one of my Q&A, I described to you all the differences between physical sunscreens and chemical sunscreens. So I encourage you to check that out if you missed it. So how do we know a sunscreen is any good? Well, efficacy of sunscreens are quantified by two measures. The sun protective factor, or SPF, and UVA protection. In the United States, sunscreens that meet these requirements are labeled UVA, UVB, broad spectrum sunscreens. The measurement of SPF depends on something called minimal erythema dosing or MED dosing. So SPF measurement is actually performed on people wherein sunscreen is applied to a small square on their body at a density of two milligrams per centimeter squared. This square is then exposed to UV light along with an adjacent side of skin not covered by sunscreen then the minimal dose of ultraviolet light required to produce barely perceptible light pink coloration is compared in the sunscreen covered patch versus the sunscreen uncovered patch at 16 and 24 hours after exposure to ultraviolet light. And that ratio reflects the minimal erythema dosing, and that is how SPF is determined. It essentially determines a sunscreen's ability to protect our skin from a sunburn primarily caused by UVB. Now ultraviolet light that comes from the sun occurs in wavelengths, UVB and UVA. UVB is the wavelength that actually burns our skin. UVA, however, penetrates deeply into the skin, contributing to wrinkles and suppresses the immune system within the skin, also damaging skin health. Because the SPF is a measure of a sunscreen's efficacy at protecting us from a sunburn, it's essentially a measure of how good a sunscreen is at protecting us against UVB. So how do we know if a sunscreen is any good at protecting us from UVA? The wavelengths of ultraviolet light that penetrate more deeply into the skin and contribute to wrinkles, photoaging, and suppressed immunity in the skin. Well, methods for testing UVA protection are actually a little bit more technical, a little bit more tricky, and difficult to reproduce. UVA testing is done differently in different countries. Each country has its own assay for measuring UVA efficacy. However, that, that is not quantified numerically. So what does an SPF of 30 or 50 mean and should and is higher better? An SPF of 30 provides about 97% protection, whereas an SPF of 50 affords approximately 98%. You can see the small percentage difference really is not much. Therefore, the FDA has proposed limits on labeling of sunscreen SPF to be no higher than 50 so as to not mislead you, the consumer, into thinking that one sunscreen labeled 97 is better than another sunscreen labeled 93. It's really pulling teeth at this juncture. But suffice it to say that in the United States, if a sunscreen is labeled as broad spectrum UVB, UVA, it has met those requirements and can offer protection against both. So I frequently get questions about visible light. That's the light that we can see with our eyes. We now know that visible light can contribute to dark spots and melasma on the face. Sunscreens that offer good protection into the visible light here in the United States are those sunscreens that contain the ingredients zinc and or titanium dioxide, physical sunscreens. We know that darker skin types are more susceptible to discoloration related to ultraviolet and invis visible light exposure. 
Physical sunscreens offer the best uh, protection against these broader wavelengths of light. However, as an even added kick within your sunscreen, sunscreens containing the ingredient iron oxide add further protection to visible light. Therefore, if you are using a tinted sunscreen, such as the one that I, such as the one that I use by Elta MD uh, with iron oxide in it, you're getting protection from the visible light as well. Now we know that visible light plays a role in, in uh, discoloration in the skin, but we don't quite know if it plays any role in uh, skin cancer. That brings me to the next question, and that is, can sunscreens offer any protection against infrared radiation, and does that contribute to skin cancer? Infrared radiation from the sun does um, have some effects on the skin that we uh, know from laboratory studies, such as generation of heat and reactive oxygen species. However, the science is just not there yet to, to, to know for sure if it plays any role in skin cancer. Our sunscreens do not offer protection against infrared radiation. So sunscreens should always be used in con conjunction with other photoprotective measures. They should not be used alone. Many studies have demonstrated that most consumers lack a fundamental knowledge and understanding of the relationship between sunscreen use and sun protection. In practice, most people apply only about 25 to 30 percent of the required amount to meet the SPF on the label of the bottle, essentially resulting in an effective SPF of less than 33 percent of the labeled SPF. So if you remember, I mentioned that SPF testing is done using two milligrams per centimeter square of sunscreen to a predefined test site on a human volunteer. So in order to achieve that density on you, how much do you need to use? It is recommended that you apply one teaspoon, that's five mLs, of sunscreen to the face, neck, and head, one teaspoon to each upper arm, and two teaspoons to the front and the back torso, as well as two teaspoons to each of the lower legs. In my last Q&A, I discussed some of the shortcomings of chemical sunscreens, those containing ingredients like avabenzone, and pointed out that these ingredients in chemical sunscreens do degrade upon exposure to UV light. Chemical sunscreens, as I've said in prior Q&As, need to be applied 20 minutes before going outdoors because they need to form a film. And they do degrade, as I said in my last Q&A, with exposure to UV light. And so it is imperative that they be reapplied approximately every two hours while you are outdoors. Physical sunscreens, those containing zinc or titanium dioxide exclusively, are effective immediately when applied to the skin. However, it is a common misconception that I hear in the comments that they do not need to be reapplied. You are, they do in fact need to be reapplied approximately every two hours as well. Not because they are degrading, but because as you are going through your day and sweating, sunscreen invariably gets removed and flicked away and it is imperative that you reapply it to continue to have that protection against a burn. And the third misconception that I, I frequently see is, well, I was out all day with my sunscreen, I didn't even reapply it, and I didn't get a burn, that's fantastic. I will underscore this, the pot, that, that sunburn is only, a, that lack of a sunburn does not mean lack of UV damage to your skin. Sunburn is caused primarily by UVB, and many chemical filters and chemical sunscreens that protect against UVB are quite, quite stable. Whereas those that protect against the UVA, the, the wavelengths that penetrate more deeply and do not necessarily burn us, um, those filters degrade. So if you don't reapply your sunscreen, you may be getting excessive, excessive UVA exposure in the absence of a sunburn. The chemical filter, avabenzone, which in the United States is the chemical filter that provides the most robust protection against UVA, its rate of degradation has been shown to be accelerated by the presence of titanium dioxide. And therefore, it is not FDA approved that avabenzone be used in combination with titanium dioxide in a sunscreen. This is important to know if you use chemical sunscreens containing avabenzone and then subsequently layer sunscreens containing titanium dioxide, or if you rely exclusively on chemical sunscreens containing avabenzone and also use mineral makeups 
or makeups that contain titanium dioxide, that the titanium dioxide has been shown to accelerate the rate of degradation of the avobenzone. And, it, and because it is the avobenzone in the chemical sunscreen that affords the most UVA prote protection, you could be compromising this to a certain extent. Both zinc and titanium dioxide, however, in physical sunscreens do, protect, do afford some protection, do afford good protection against UVA. However, sunscreen molecules in powder form, such as your mineral makeups or in sprays, do not reliably distribute sunscreen molecules onto the surface of the skin to ensure a reliable level of SPF. So I will re-emphasize the fact that a lack of a sunburn or lack of redness does not imply that you did not receive damaging ultraviolet light to your skin. So the need to reapply sunscreen cannot be underscored enough. It is critical, it is important, it, and it is imperative. And the, the next point that I will also emphasize to you is that sunscreen has many, many shortcomings. As you've learned from part one and part two of the Q&As, sunscreen has many shortcomings, okay? It requires you to put it on at a high enough concentration. It requires you to find one that you like and tolerate well. It requires that, uh, you know, it be if it's a chemical sunscreen, it be put on 20 minutes before going outdoors. There are all these caveats to sunscreen. It alone is not enough, okay? So it is imperative that when you are outdoors, like at the beach, that you continue to protect the skin using measures such as a, um, like a sun protective cardigan, like I wear in my videos. I love this one by Cooley Bar. It has universal protective factor 50 in it. You need to be wearing a, a broad brimmed hat um, as well and uh, protecting your skin. When you are outdoors um, at the beach, you also need to be aware of the fact that sun, that ultraviolet light reflects off of surfaces. And so um, areas that are not protected and that are not, so areas of the skin that are not protected, um, when those wavelengths scatter up onto your face, you're getting unnecessary ultraviolet damage there. So you're getting an unnecessary exposure and, and damage from UV there that you may not be aware of. So it's important to wear a broad spectrum sunscreen, reapply it, wear your hat, wear your long sleeves, um, and you know, in, enjoy your life, but be aware that um, sunscreen is important. Sunscreen is important in reducing skin cancer. Sun, sunscreen use is important in protecting you from a burn, but it needs to be applied consistently. It needs to be applied thoroughly, and it alone is not enough. So then the next question that comes up, and I've addressed, I believe, in other Q&As, is that I believe there are some sunscreens that are marketed as once-a-day sunscreens. Um, these are available, per, um, I believe, in, in parts of the United Kingdom. Um, and it is the consensus, and I agree, of the British Academy of Dermatologists that these sunscreens should in fact be reapplied um, as any other sunscreen and that you not rely on this once a day application because, um, like I said, you are sweating and going about your day and sunscreen gets wiped off. That has been demonstrated in, you know, in other studies that you know, even though the sunscreen may be stable as a filter on your face, even though the sunscreen may be a stable blocker on your face, your, your movement and throughout the day and sweating, it's invariably going to come off. So it needs to be reapplied despite claims that it's a once a day sunscreen. And then the last questions that I'll address is with, with regards to HelioCare. So HelioCare is um, a supplement that uh, in, contains the ingredient Polypodium Leucomotus. So there is quite a bit of data to support that the ingredient Polypodium Leucomotus can cut down on some of the uh, damage related to sun exposure in your skin. Um, however, I, I will underscore this, it is a supplement, so it is not regulated in the same manner. And so it's hard to guarantee the, the HelioCare. It, there are studies showing that it is effective in, in clearing um, damaged cells from, from UV exposure. By no means should it be used um, by itself without uh, sun protection. Not as a, oh, I went out all day and forgot my sunscreen, so I, but I'm good because I'm going to take my HelioCare. No, it doesn't work that way. So I will caution you that. All right, guys, so I hope you found this video helpful. That's going to conclude the sunscreen series <laughs> of the Q&As. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys in my next Q&A. Bye! <laughs>